Yep, we're answering the question, does the Bible support slavery? If this has ran across your mind and you're like me and it kind of was mind boggling, this video is for you because this is going to be the time where we're going to dive into scripture to see, is it biblically supported, right? Does God support the actions of slavery? And it's kind of crazy because when you think of slavery, you think of the 400 years of slavery, right? Enslaved African-Americans, right? Ancestors, people who were, wow, that truck is kind of loud or whatever that is. But anyway, um, people who were enslaved, <laughs> People who were enslaved for 400 years, right? We see a whole lot of evil activity taking place, right? The mistreatment to slaves, their families, their loved ones. We're talking about things like raping their women, right? We're talking about unnecessary harm, unnecessary killings, unnecessary deaths. People who are chained and shackled. People who are forced into so much harm, right? I mean, this was literally the way of living, right? Mostly in excuse me, southern parts of the country for so many years, right? Northern too, but just in general in the United States, okay? So Western culture or Westernized slavery, if you will, slavery that took place in the Western culture, um, is it supported? Because this is the first thing that comes to our mind when we see the term slave, maybe even servant, right? And there are different categories in scripture, where we see servant and it doesn't carry the same implications as it does in another verse. So we do have to be mindful of that. OK, but when we look at slavery, what does God support that? Like what in the world is going on? Right. So I want to bring you to some text just so I'm not sounding too crazy. Right. I want to bring you and show you a couple pieces of text where we are going to just basically dive in and really understand what is this text saying in context? And what does this mean for slavery and if God supported? So I'm going to take you to Ephesians 6, okay? Ephesians 6, verse 5 through 9, which reads this, okay? Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor from their eye and when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one of each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Verse nine reads this again, new, new international version, by the way. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. OK, so there's a whole lot that's said there that really debunks this idea of God supporting Western culturized slavery. But I want to take it another step further. OK, in the book of Philemon, that's literally one chapter. <laughs> Paul writes to, t to Philemon. OK, uh, Paul, who is still a prisoner, uh, who is still in prison, writes to Philemon and he's writing to him in regards to a runaway slave named Onesimus. OK, Onesimus has a past. We don't we aren't given the, com the understanding of his past. Uh, but we can get the sense that his past wasn't uh, so welcoming because he was a runaway slave. OK, he ran from the plant from Philemon's um, house, from Philemon's place, ran a thousand miles back to Rome, right, where he encountered Paul, where we read in Scripture that his life was changed. He gave his life to Christ. He started uh, working with Paul, serving Paul. And Paul thought that it was a good thing, that it was in his best interest to return back to his owner, back to his master, who is Philemon? OK, so, yes, slavery existed in this time. But is there a difference? That's really the question we want to ask. OK, I want to read you a couple of verses in Philemon uh, to kind of give us an understanding. I, I don't want to leave you with generalities. We want to open the scripture here. OK, so Philemon one, verse eight, starting at verse eight, says this. Therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you or a little while for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you 
both as fellow both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. OK, so again, we have this setting where Onesimus, who ran away from Philemon, encounters Paul while he's in Rome, who was of service to Paul, who gave his life to Christ under the ministry of Paul. And Paul is like, yeah, so I would keep him, but I'm going to send him back. I'm not going to do anything without your consent. OK, I'm going to send him back to you. Right. Verse 13, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. So he's like, yo, I wouldn't keep him without your consent. But I also want you to understand that I, what I'm what I'm doing here, I'm sending on this image back to you. But I don't want you to take him back forcefully, but rather willingly. OK, he says, I want you to accept him back. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. OK, and that's amazing, right, to see such a, a, a strong passage that stuck out to me in verse 15. Right. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Right. Then verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. OK, so Philemon is saved. Philemon knows Christ. Slavery is in this time. And Paul is talking about sending a runaway slave back to his brother in Christ and then referring to Onesimus, who is the runaway slave, as now a brother to Philemon, but sending him back as a slave. Like, explain this. Cool. That's what we're about to do. Right. So before we explain this, you have to see that there is a difference between Western culturized slavery and biblical time slavery. OK, two different entities, two different things. Let's talk about it. OK, so obviously we have the Western culture slavery. Right. As we remember through history classes, um, you know, celebrating Black History Month, we are reminded of all of those treacherous years. Right. All of those horrible, horrid, evil times where slavery was going down in North America. OK, all over the place. You know, we had people who were enchained, who were enslaved against their will. Families taken from them, wives being raped, people being unmercifully killed, chained for 100 years. OK, like nothing but pure evil um, and, and just every, like every sense of the word evil. Like that's what that was. OK, so we think of those things. Right. Biblical time slavery was completely different from Western culture slavery. OK, in the sense that biblical time slavery was willing and based on economics okay those are like the two things you need to know when it comes to slavery in biblical times it was willingly so they were willingly enslaving themselves this wasn't something like they were given like hey would you like to be my slave it was more like a yeah i need to provide for my family i have no means to meet it so i'm going to voluntarily submit myself to an owner to a master Right. Who can provide my family with what we need? It was based on economics. OK, so we have two major differences. Right. We have Western culture that was forced against the will and completely based on racial racism. Right. Prejudice. OK. Right. Remember, we African-Americans were only considered two thirds of a person, whereas in biblical times, these people were willingly submitting themselves to slave owners because they were receiving payment they were receiving something where their 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 needs were being met their family's needs were being met and they were being provided for right so this was an agreement this wasn't something that was forced it was solely an agreement it's gonna it blows your mind i know it did me too okay so based off of those predications alone that biblical time slavery is based on economics and was willingly volu volunteering versus Western culture slavery that we think of, which was against the will. Right. And solely based on racism. Now we can come to the conclusion. OK, based on the character of God, knowing who God is. Right. We describe him as holy, just, righteous, perfect, not an ounce of evil, doesn't stand for evil, but stands up against evil. Right. God would not support, did not support and will never support the evils that Western culture slavery partook in.
Okay, not only just Western culture slavery, but there's so many other different kinds of slavery uh, that, that we could discuss about. Right. Uh, sex trafficking, sex slave, um, all these other different uh, labors that are not just pushing slavery, but it's legit slavery. OK, so God being just and holy, his character and who he is would never support this idea of what the Western culture allowed slavery to be. Right. In fact, there is writing. And let me actually pull up the verse here. There is scriptural writing that shows that slave traders are actually considered uh, just as bad as someone who is a murderer. Right. Like it is condemned in scriptural writing. OK, let's see here. First Timothy one verse eight through ten. I believe that's the text. First Timothy one verse eight through ten. Yep. Look at this one verse eight through ten. All right. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. So all of those things that were just listed in First Timothy 1 verse 8 through 10 is contrary to to sound doctrine, which simply means that this is not supported. These are not actions or lifestyles supported by the gospel at all. Nowhere. OK, so if you remember history, you remember history classes, slave traders bringing ships of slaves to the new world and putting them on plantations. And it just starts the vicious cycle of the evilness of slavery in North America that was against God's word. Not only was it against God's word, but it does not represent the character of God. So all of this evil that takes place, all of these things that take place in North America, God did not have his hand involved in any of that. They tried to tie his name to it. Right. You had slave owners who were trying to use the Bible and, and really manipulate it to try and get people to see that. Yeah, God supports this. And because God supports this, you need to support it and things like that. And they were completely taking text out of context all the way around because nowhere in scripture does God agree with slavery, even though slavery was taking place in biblical times. Again, it's not the same as it was transferred to be from one side of the world to another. And it's kind of crazy because we kind of don't really know how we got from an economic based slavery where people were volunteering themselves to then coming to the Western culture and seeing people forced against their will beaten raped killed all of these things so many evils going on like like it's just a crazy transition and nothing else can make sense of that other than sin and man getting in the way man creating their own rules man and the sickness and evilness of humanity that caused that shift okay so now that we look through that okay we see some differences between the biblical times western culture slavery that are completely different Right. Also, not to mention that in biblical times, not only was it based on economics, volunteering. Right. We had doctors, lawyers, farmers who were willingly uh, submitting themselves to a master because the master was providing for them and their family. It was the way for means to be met. OK. It was also regulated. OK. That's not something you hear often when it comes to slavery discussions. But yes, in time, in biblical times, they were regulated. OK. So we see some differences there. All right. So. I want to share with you or actually just go back to the text that we initially opened up with. Right. So, again, Ephesians chapter six, verse five through nine. Let me pull that back up. Ephesians chapter six, verse five through nine. Right. We see this context of slaves. Obey your earthly masters. Masters treat your slaves accordingly. We see this relationship taking place. Now, oftentimes you'll see people related to. Yeah, well, this is employee to employer. OK. To an extent, I can get that right, because no one or it's slavery isn't um, well, racial slavery as we once knew it is no longer the case. Right. So we get the imp the implication or the mindset of, hey, yeah, employee to employer. So you're going to do these things. 
right? And in actually, in all actuality, uh, this text actually can be taken in that direction because, again, slavery in biblical time was based on economics. OK, so they were receiving something for volunteering themselves to be uh, enslaved to a master, right, for their families and being taken care of all the things that we just went over. OK, so let me keep this text in context. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Right. So Paul is is saying, hey, yeah, you are going to obey your earthly masters and do your work as you would unto the Lord. Right. Everything you do. You will do as you would unto the Lord. In this case, slaves, be obedient to your earthly masters, right? Obey them not only to win their favor with their eye, when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Okay, so don't cheat yourself. Don't be like, you know, if you're doing a workout and you're doing abs and it's burning and it's going crazy and the coach walks by and he, he you know, as he's walking by, you're doing it or as she's walking by, you're doing it. But then as soon as they turn their back, you just stop. Right. So he's saying, hey, yeah, don't do it if they're just looking at you. Don't be all about the work if they're just looking at you. No, be honest. Be di diligent. Um, be be honest in what you're doing and what you're doing. Right. Do from your heart. Do from your heart for God. OK. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. OK, that backs it up. Right. We're going to serve God, not for people pleasing, but to please God. We're going to give this job our all. OK. Verse eight, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Verse nine and masters treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. So this text even alone, Ephesians six, verse nine, debunks this idea that God would ever support the evils of slavery in the Western culture. OK, God plays no favoritism. So it doesn't matter if you're black, doesn't matter if you're white, doesn't matter if you're Mexican, Hispanic. Uh, Asian, uh, European, it doesn't matter what race, what ethnicity, what, you know, it doesn't matter. God plays no favorites. Well, we can clearly see that in Western culture slavery, there was clearly a sign of favoritism that not only stemmed there, but unfortunately, we still see those kinds of signs today where people are favoriting one race, one group, one people over another. And God does not play favoritism. Now, I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to run away with this and be like, oh, so God doesn't play favoritism. So I get to be whatever I want to be. And, and God's going to love me and accept me and support me regardless. No, that's not what this text is saying, because in the end, God is not going to contradict himself or his character. Also, including standing for righteousness. He's not going to contradict that. OK, this text does not say that God is going to support you in everything you do because he doesn't play favorites. But what this means is that he's impartial. So he loves everyone the same. Yes, he loves everyone the same. But this doesn't mean that he loves everything you do. Right. This is why the scripture preaches repentance and forgiveness and coming to Christ and admitting that we're sinners, because just because God loves us doesn't mean he loves what we do, what we get ourselves involved in. That doesn't mean that. OK, so don't run away with this idea of no favoritism. So I just get to be whatever I want to be. That's not what this text is suggesting. But what this text is suggesting is that, hey, masters of these slave owners or masters of these slaves. Right. Even though they're slaves to you in the flesh, you respect them, you love them, you treat them with kindness and you don't play favoritism. Right. Because how you treat them is ultimately how God's going to treat you. Like That's the picture that we get. If you mistreat them, God's going to throw that right back to you. And allow that to come back your direction. OK, so that's the context of the text in Ephesians six. If we go back to Philemon, we read a majority of it earlier. Right. And I'll pick back up where we left off. But understand, again, Onesimus, who is a runaway slave, comes down to Rome, visits Paul under Paul's ministry, gets saved, comes to Christ. And now Paul is asking Philemon to receive Onesimus back unto his care willingly. Right. He's like, I'm not going to make this a, a decision or make this a thing where you force. I'm going to force him or force you to receive him. He says, no, this needs to be willingly. OK, he says this, too. He says, perhaps, again, as we went over earlier, perhaps the reason verse 15 uh, in, in Philemon, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Right. So Paul is alluding here that, hey, this separation that took place. Right. Was for a reason because even the Holy Spirit used this situation of him running from you to bring him to Christ. So this situation of him running away from you 
there wasn't bad in all of that because it was actually used or it, the Holy Spirit used this situation to bring him back to Christ or bring him to Christ. So then he goes into verse 16, no longer as a slave, as a no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. Now, that that's kind of trippy. Right. So, again, not really, though, when we remember the context. OK, he's asking him, he says, hey, when you receive him, don't receive him as you would a slave. He's now in Christ. And in Christ, Paul reminds us in Galatians that there is no neither Jew nor Greek, free nor slave. We are all one body. So because we are all one body, we all have found freedom, not in each other, but in Christ. And so we are to walk in love and treat one another be well with love because we are in Christ. We are one body, brothers and sisters. Right. So he says, hey, you're no longer going to receive him as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. He says, yeah, the flesh is saying, yeah, you're the master. So you the flesh that will try to derive you and may even try to take you to a place where you're going to try and take control of him. He says, no, you're going to love him. You're going to receive him willingly and you're going to uh, treat him as you would a brother in Christ, because that's who he is now. He gave his life to Christ. Verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul's like, hey, listen, if you consider me a good friend, you're going to you're going to want to receive him. He says, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Right. Love him as you would love me. Right. Earlier, we read that he is he referred to Onesimus as a son. So he obviously wants Philemon to receive him willingly. Right. So he's like, yeah, receive him, receive him back unto you. Verse 18. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Now, this verse 18 summarizes the idea that economics was the, the basis of slavery in biblical time. OK. Because uh, Paul was willing to take the debt on himself. Right. Again, if this if this was a case where the slave owed something, if this was the case that the slave took something and had a debt on him. Yeah, that slave would be in much trouble. Right. Because he's stealing from his master. Right. That he's willingly enslaved himself to the master. So the master is providing for him and his family. Right. This is a willingness. This is an economic based agreement. And this, you know, it, it, let's just say that Onesimus did have this debt. We don't know. But Paul suggests that, hey, if he has done you any wrong, if he has if he owes you anything, charge it to me. Don't put it on his account. Charge it to me. OK, because I want you to receive him back unto you. OK, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. He's like, I'm letting you know, like this isn't a scribe. This is me. This is me, Paul, talking to you, Philemon. OK, he says, I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer for your prayers. He finishes this chapter with fellow greetings. OK, so I read all of this to you to give you the sense of what I was speaking earlier in regards to Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, who Paul is willingly looking to send him back. Right. So the question, right, why would Paul want to send him back? Because this agreement that they made, right, they are to uphold. So Onesimus, who ran away and before he ran away, he probably was no good. Right. It could be concluded. We don't really know, but it could be concluded that Onesimus wasn't really upholding his end. He was kind of being a pain in the butt to Philemon, if you will. Right. So running away from Philemon, encountering Paul, the Holy Spirit using this separation, verse 15. Right. Perhaps this was a case where he separated you for a separated from you for a season. So you would be with him forever. So he could come back to you forever. Right. So the Holy Spirit using this situation to bring Philemon to Christ. Right. Then serving Paul. And then Paul using this, using or, you know, allowing Onesimus to be of service to him and then writing the Philemon says, hey, I'm going to send him back on your consent and I want you to receive him willingly as a brother, not as a slave. OK, and this, again, is the idea of a transformed heart. OK, that's like really the last thing I really want to share on this is that it's this all comes down to a transformed heart. Onesimus was in no shape to uphold his willing agreement because of his heart. He had a heart issue. 
right? He really wasn't looking to uphold his bargain. And again, we don't really see in text how bad Onesimus was, but Onesimus chose to run away. And according to biblical times, this was an economic agreement. So Onesimus ran away. So Onesimus running away, encountering Christ, giving his life to Christ under Paul's ministry. Paul is trying to sell Philemon, not even really sell him as if it's not true, but let Philemon know like, hey, Onesimus has given his life to Christ. He's a changed man, a transformed man who is now looking to be an, be about this in a more integrity and in more integrity, honesty, love and more of all, most of all, as a brother in Christ to you and I. He says, so, OK, so what he didn't do before, what he wasn't so honest with before, what he wasn't so honest with in his work prior to. Yeah, he is. is I'm, I'm willingly looking to send him back to you to send him back to you. And, and you receive him willingly, not as a not as a slave, but as a brother. OK, so a transformed heart Onesimus undergoes a transformation of heart and in all totality. OK, if you really want to know the key <laughs> to overcoming slavery like of any kind, even slavery that we may not see with our own two eyes in everyday life now, but it's still out there. It takes a transformation of heart. OK, like you, you aren't going to overcome this idea of slavery. Right. Without a transformed heart. OK, right. Every everybody kind of gets wild up and it gets tense when we talk about slavery and things like that. But understand that, again, God didn't support this Western culturized view of slavery. He never did and he never will. OK. And then the questions become, oh, well, then why did he allow it? Right. Why did he allow 400 years of slavery? Why did he allow so much suffering? And this is kind of where we encounter his sovereignty. Right. God is going to do ultimately what he wants to do because he rules. Now, that might make you feel salty, but it's true. That is truth. God will do what he decides to do when he decides to do it. And he allowed slavery to take place. Ultimately, it was man's decision to turn it in such a way to pervert it, to cause it to, to fall in wickedness, um, to be to be awful in all kinds of ways. So that was man's decision that God allowed, but that God also delivered us from delivered uh, uh, African-Americans from. Right. Uh, so understand that God's sovereignty rules. OK, that's why he allowed it, because God does what he does when he does it how he does it and us as his creation don't get to question or or uh, kind of raise our fist in a manner of saying we're right and he's wrong like he, he's sovereign right he's sovereign so god didn't didn't uh have anything god's hand was not in that right as of, of course as we mentioned earlier slave owners would misinterpret mistranslate all these things like god wasn't involved in that evil like god had nothing to do with that evil he didn't direct them he didn't call them he didn't do anything of that that was all man, all man for those 400 years of, of suffering. OK. But we see the slavery that is represented in biblical times where it was economical. It was willing. The masters were providing for the ones who became slaves to them. Right. And it was an exchange taking place. Labor for, for reward, labor for money, labor for this and that. OK. Which is kind of why you can see. This understanding of this employee to employer connection because biblical slavery was based on economics. OK, so as we explained in First Timothy and as we explained in Philemon and, and overall overcoming this idea of slavery requires a transformed heart. Not to mention that even in the book of Philemon, we do see forgiveness, right? Uh, Paul ushering and wanting Philemon to forgive Onesimus for running away, receive him back into him, not just as a slave, but as a brother. Like we're seeing forgiveness and a transformation of heart that is able to overcome this idea of slavery. OK, so that was a pretty winded, <laughs> long video. So I hope you were able to get something out of this. And if you were like me and you had questions about this, I hope that this was of help to you. No, God does not support the evils of slavery from the Western culture, not culturized uh, viewpoint. God does not support it. OK, slavery was taking place in Scripture. Yes, 
but it wasn't as we normally would think it. And as we were taught it growing up in school of the chains and racial and and all these things that were evil compiled on one another. That was the basis and the ground roots of slavery in Western culture. But it was rather predicated on economics and willingness where people were looking to enslave themselves. Doctors, lawyers, farmers, all kinds of people were willing to enslave themselves to someone who was willing and able to provide for their needs and the needs of their family. It was a labor for exchange of reward. Okay, so I hope that this clears up some things. I hope that this was very helpful to you. Um, And I can't wait to have our next conversation here shortly and soon. But as always, until next time, peace.